man needs to go away. I think he needs to live in a different country. He's done enough damage to this one, let him damage somebody else's now. In the late 60s and early 70s, Ralph would be in national polls as one of the most famous admired Americans. People would write to him thinking that he could solve their problems. And I think Ralph got more mail than the Beatles. Ralph had decided to do six or eight teams attacking different agencies. Members of the press have referred to you as Nader's Raiders. We were going to make the country what it ought to be by working and pressing the system to work. He had built a legislative record as a private citizen that would have been the envy of any modern president. Imagine if you got in a car and the airbag said Ralph Nader, or if the seatbelt said Nader, or you look at the air and it's cleaner and it says Nader on it. If people would see that on a day-to-day -day basis, they'd understand the effect that this guy has had on their daily life. Ralph Nader, a name synonymous with standing up for the common good. I caught up with the legendary crusader recently during an eye chat. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Eddie. It's nice to be here. In 1965, you alone decided to take on the biggest corporation in the world. What were you thinking? I was thinking if we could uh, uh, get GM to behave and build safer cars as the leader in the industry, the rest of the industry will follow. You have influenced people's lives in America all across the board. So everything from seat belts and airbags to product labeling on food, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. Are there more battles to be won? Oh, you know better than to ask a question like that, Eddie. <laughs> Do they're, I? They're, <laughs> you got corporate giants now astride the world, bringing governments to their knees, pitting governments against one another, uh, putting their own executives in high government positions, controlling elections, uh, concentrating the media with trivia, and fantasy, uh, and we are being corporatized. The universities, the schools, commercial values are dominating ever more deeply over the critical civic values that spell a democratic society in the quest for justice. You became the third party candidate in what basically has evolved into a two party system. But they vilify you for it. Ross Perot came along and did it before you did it. And, you know, he just kind of went off and did his own thing after he uh, ran his campaign. And nobody hated him. Nobody loved him. They, you know, he just kind of stayed like this. You, on the other hand, became such a polarizing figure. Why you and not him? Billionaire's prerogative. <laughs> You're not a billionaire? <laughs> it's Ross Perot, you know. And uh, people are used to... Uh, Billionaires and multimillionaires uh, now moving into politics. And uh, increasingly, people are getting the message, aren't they, that if they don't have a lot of money, they can't run for office, even at the state level and sometimes at the local level. So we've got to change that uh, because if the system is so rotten and corrupt that it drives out good people from running for elected office, who do you think is going to be in elective office? It's going to be the political minions of big business transforming our governments, local, state, and national, into corporate uh, bazaars. What about the people that refer to you as the spoiler? What do you say to them? I think Bush took more votes away from Gore than I did. So why do they focus on the Green Party candidate? Because they think somehow third party independent candidates or second class citizens should shut up and get in line and let the two parties control all the votes and uh, get the payola from the big companies and their executives and drive our country deeper into the ground, more poverty, more uninsured people, more corruption, more tax inequities, more pollution, uh, more of everything we shouldn't have in this country. Having said that, I do think, and Gore believes, that he won the election in 2000. It was taken from him uh, before, during, and after Election Day from Tallahassee to that partisan 5-4 Supreme Court decision. The film, An Unreasonable Man, how long did it take to make, and how was it to have a film crew follow you around like that? Well, they didn't really follow me around. I just gave them the last interview uh, in two parts for about seven hours. I, I didn't have anything to do with the film. Um, Thank you, Ralph, for the Iraq War. Thank you, Ralph, for the tax cuts. Thank you, Ralph, for the destruction of the environment. Thank you, Ralph, for the destruction of the Constitution. But uh, I swear to you, Eddie, I didn't pay uh, uh, Eric Alterman uh, to say what he said. <laughs> you didn't? <laughs> no. <laughs> what does Ralph Nader do to relax? What, what do you do for fun? 
Uh, well, I, I give interviews. Once in a while, I, <clears throat> I watch a champion uh, sports t uh, game. Once in a while, I take, uh, take in a movie. Uh, once in a while, I read a little uh, fiction. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, justice uh, cannot afford to take a day off, and all of us who want to advance justice have got to spend more, uh, more of their leisure time uh, doing it after they finish their work and spend time with their family. Of all the things that you've done in your lifetime so far, what's the one thing that you're most proud of? Just encouraging people to think that they could uh, be effective citizens themselves. They can make a difference, take on Exxon and uh, City Hall and uh, uh, stop rationalizing their own futility because once they convince themselves that they're powerless, guess what? Uh, they remain powerless. What's your biggest regret? Uh, we didn't spend enough time uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, building uh, grassroots organizations and getting civic uh, skills taught in the schools or at least having an after-school network all over the country where children learned how to practice democracy, they learned civic skills, they learned how to enjoy uh, advancing justice and solving problems. And of course, by now, they would be major leaders in the country and the world. Uh, we had a lot of young people with us, but we didn't do it on a grand scale. Mr. Nader, thank you so much for joining us. It was a real pleasure, and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, and thank uh, Henriette and Steve for uh, two and a half years of work that made all this possible. I most certainly will. Thanks. Uh, no. Yeah, what's your health insurance joke? You want to hear it? Yeah. Doctor passes away and goes to heaven, meets God. He said, God, I've always wanted to ask you this question. God said, go ahead, doctor. He said, when do you think we'll get universal health insurance in the United States of America? God replied, not in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you so much for your Have fun with Neil Cavuto. <laughs> yeah, yeah.